Hi, this is Riley. I read a hundred books in 2023 and I already shared with you guys my top picks, what I thought were the best books that I read. So today I thought we'd get a little spicy, get a little negative, and I'd share with you the books that I thought were the worst ones that I read and some of them made me very angry. I will say though that 2023 was a good year for my book reading like these are the these were the worst of the worst and i still th like i think i only read one book that doesn't have any redeemable qualities that i'm like this is bad and they should feel bad all these other books they might even be there might even be some on the list that you enjoy or would enjoy like they all have something about them even though i was annoyed that i could see like why someone might like them i just think they're wrong well, I guess we'll start with the one that I thought was the absolute worst book that I read. And then we'll go by like what angered me and, or disappointed me the most. So bottom of the barrel, number one worst book that I read all year. It's called Back in the Day, A Hundred Things Everyone Used to Know How to Do by Michael Powell. Now this is like one of those little, you buy these books as gifts, right? They're small, they're cute. Usually they're full of quotes or they're just like, but you don't expect like a super high quality from these books because they're things that your mom buys you on holidays because they kind of make her think of you. I have a ton of these because like all women, my mom went through a period of time where this was the gift that she gave everybody, like these little books of quotes or these little books of like funny history facts, etc. I got this a hundred things everyone should know how to do and I didn't have super high standards for it. I just thought, okay, this is gonna be like a cute little quick interesting read. It was so poorly done. The formatting was wonky so it was really hard to read. I am a very uh, word person. I read challenging books but I can have a difficult time if like the formatting is weird, like I think any human can. I'm not even gonna blame my neurodivergence for this one because like I don't usually have any problem reading. I have a problem listening. I don't usually have any problem reading. So uh, this book was just like formatted really weird. Like sometimes things would like be left off certain sections or like, and then like suddenly appear on the pa next page or like, it was just like slapped together. Like somebody did it in Microsoft Word. There were typos, they didn't put a whole lot of care into this book before shipping it out. The things that are picked are effing random. I know obviously like a hundred things everyone used to know how to do, but for me that's things like everybody used to know, except for the rich people, but you could like fairly say that most everybody used to know how to like do laundry by hand right or like sew a sock even wealthy people like the women knew how to sew i expected a book to be like that maybe like something like how to ride a horse and there's like some things like that but then there's like how to lay siege to a medieval fortress or like very specific things that only one group of people in one area of the world in one social class ever knew how to do it i don't know how he picked these things also they're all written very poorly the scope of how he explains them it's like some of the things he clearly is obsessed with there are some that's like really detailed on how to build a canoe which is interesting but then like it'll be like how to keep bees and it'll be really vague it'll be like put the bees in a hive and it's like what does that mean <laughs> What? How do I make the hive? Like, some of them read like he literally expects you to follow the instructions point by point, and then other things read like the shittiest blog description for SEO that you've ever read. So basically, it's all kind of a collection of random shitty blogs made to get Google searches, but not actually made to help anybody. So it was really boring. It was actually very hard to get through. Like I picked it up because it was short. Yeah, I, so the reason I'm like ranting so much about this is it does bother me because this is like a book that got published and made it into Barnes and Noble. And that's because they, it was like this little cute book and it bothers me when traditional publishing doesn't put a minimum of care into the work that it outputs. Which is something I feel like I'm seeing more and more lately. The next book I'm going to complain about, if you watch my shorts, you've already heard me complain about this. 
But um, Henry James is the turn of the screw. The, the book itself, first off, it's like the story is not bad. There's two things that make me angry about it. One is that the way it's written is actually very confusing. Uh, like, to, like, not even like, oh, is it like, we're not sure what's happening here. The unreliable narrator, like, The Turn of the Screw is famous for being the first psychological thriller. We'll get to why that really annoys me in a second. It's just confusing in that you'll like read a paragraph and be like, wait, didn't something else, like she's trying to tell the maid, like the housekeeper, what happened, but we just saw what happened and that was different. And like, sometimes he has sentences that are so confusing. And I had to sit there and like read, like his sentence structure is just wonky. Henry James's sentence structure is wonky. There, I said it. I said it. I read difficult books. I love challenging, dense books. I One of the best books I read last year was one of Proust's In Search of Long Time. And he can have a sentence that goes on for a fucking page and a half. I don't have a problem with long, difficult sentences if they're written well so that it's possible to parse them. Henry James does not always do this. Now, this book is considered, this is the main thing that makes me mad about it. This book is considered like the first psychological thriller because it's like, are there really ghosts or is the governess just crazy? Henry James didn't mean to do that at all. Like he actually, in the edition that I have in the foreword, he's like, oh, the ghosts are real. They're real ghosts. I just thought it would be spookier if I made it unclear what's going on, like, which is something that Alfred Hitchcock says, right, is a big thing about horror, is that people are more scared of like what's happening behind the closed door, right? You can never show somebody on screen, Hitchcock words it better than that, but like you can never show somebody on screen something that will be as scary as their imagination, as the suspense and wondering about horrors. Like, I don't know why I circled my own face for horrors because I look great today. <sighs> Henry James, just like was like, it'll be more spooky if I'm less clear. And so he accidentally made a book where people are like, I don't think that these ghosts are actually there. I'm going to blame the woman. So everybody's like misogyny accidentally made this book like literarily relevant to history. And that infuriates me. It does also show what something that's really important to keep in mind. Like I'm an author. The book is ultimately made by the readers. Like your legacy and how the book is actually experienced out in the world is so much more important than your intent. You're kind of just a, you're, you're a vessel because it doesn't matter that Henry James is like, oh, the ghosts are real. People still talk about this book and like make new versions of it and make movies of it now because it's interesting and not at all in a way that he intended for it to be interesting. So it makes me mad. Also makes me mad because I read three more, I think it was like three more Henry James novellas or short stories. They were all boring. <laughs> They're all boring. His prose is like unnecessarily complicated, even for the period that he's writing in. Um, he has cool concepts, like the summary of the story sounds cool, but then the endings are always like the most boring version of the ending. And I don't know if maybe that might be cultural in that like when it came out, it's possible that the endings that he wrote were more like, oh, for like his contemporaries than they are for me. Obviously a little bit of a different time period and I've seen horrific shit in movies and books. But like, yeah, it's just, if you're, I'm assuming if you're watching this video, you're also a contemporary of me and not Henry James. So the rest of his oeuvre is really not that interesting. Definitely more interesting to read or watch adaptations of his work or things inspired by his work, because I think people do improve on it compared to his actual prose and plotting. Okay, the next book that made me mad. Okay, I'll try to be kind of quick with this one. I always say that and it's a lie. I'm never quick when I talk about it, like anything ever. Paula McLean's The Paris Wife. Now I'm a huge, like I am a Paris hoe. I just love Paris content. I'm obsessed, especially expat shit. Like, I just want to be a writer in Paris, sitting in a little cafe, eating my little croissant with my little latte. That's all I want. That's all I want from this world, okay? That's like the dream. 
all right is it just sit in a little paris cafe or like and then go read in a garden i love it i love everything about paris i've read so many books about it and it's so easy to get me to like it and enjoy it this book was not enjoyable so it's called the paris wife it's about hemingway's first wife hadley who was his wife when they were in Paris and she had his first child. That's a weird way to word that, Riley. Like that, that feels like, so, like that's, like they had a child together there. Hadley raised their child. The more fair way to put that is Hadley raised a child that Hemingway provided the like male DNA for is like the more fair way to word that. But anyway, the book is from Hadley's point of view. She is not interesting. She is very dull. She's very proud of being dull, which is nice, I guess. But she's not very interesting and she has no character arc. She has no change except like, I don't know, she becomes, she like accepts herself as a dull person, I guess. The other thing is that like the author at several points actually ditches Hadley's perspective and writes from Hemingway's. And it's obvious that the author just loves Hemingway. It's like, just have the courage to write a book about Hemingway then. Like, don't pretend like you're being feminist. Like, it was so clear that the author thought Hemingway was a much more interesting person and a much more interesting character than Hadley. And she kind of convinced me. I went into this book like, Hemingway's a D-bag, you know? Like, I like the stuff by him that I've read for the most part, but he's a D-bag and I'm so excited to see this woman's history. By like the end of the book, I was like, that woman is so boring and I understand why Hemingway left her. <laughs> like that's not supposed to be what happens in the with the book. The other thing is that Hadley doesn't like Paris or anyone in it. She meets all these wonderful, interesting people and then she just shits on them the whole time. Like she's like, I don't have any friends, but she hates everybody around her and is like, they're empty and vapid. She's really, really mean about Zelda Fitzgerald, which, Maybe that's accurate. Maybe Hadley fucking hated her, which could be reasonable, but I don't think the author had to be so mean about Zelda Fitzgerald. Like there is some interpretation going on here. Mostly it just reads, it doesn't even really have a personality. It just reads like Hadley listing off facts that anyone could just get from a Hemingway biography. So it was really disappointing. And then I found out after because I read the author's little afterword and she said that she'd never been to Paris before writing the book, which I guess you don't have, you don't have to, but I think maybe that's why she kind of missed a lot of the magic. Like I just, the fact that like Hadley is not in love in, with Paris, does not even like being there at all, really m kind of ruined the book for me. Cause it's like, what's the point then? Like, why am I reading this book? And I get like, pointing out the things that were not holly jolly, which is good. Like obviously Hemingway's version is way too like, oh, everything was great. Like his uh, a movable feast is obviously him like painting over a lot of the grief that he gave this woman, but the book doesn't even really go into that that well. So it's just not very good. There's better books about Paris. And I'm sure like a lot of people did enjoy it, but there's better books about Paris and there's better books about reclaiming a, a woman in history <laughs> and showing her side of things. That was disappointing. Another book on this list is Salman Rushdie's The Enchantress of Florence. I already said everything that I need to say about Salman Rushdie's The Enchantress of Florence. It's just, he had a lot of big ideas and ended up making this like one of my friends read it <laughs> and it like I gave it to her because I was ranting about it and she was like that sounds really good actually let me try it like she was sure I was wrong and then she started reading it and she was like is this guy a virgin like has he ever talked to a woman like she could not get she like she was like life is too short and could not actually finish the book so I you know I think that's hilarious that's not necessarily like exactly the same as my opinion about it but Life is short. There are other books. There's other, there's better books by Salman Rushdie. <laughs> I'll like put a little card up if you want to see like all my rants and recommendations, but it just didn't do it, which was sad because I really liked it when I read it in college. But since then I've just read so many better books. It just uh, was not very good. Not good enough to justify all the misogyny. The last one that I'll talk about, and then I've got a special honorable mention. So get excited for that. I think the last one that I'll mention is um, If Not Winter 
technically by Sappho, but it's an English translation. I've read translations of Sappho before that I really, really enjoyed. Love, love. So the only reason this is on my list is because this is a text that's marketed like a beautiful poetic translation of Sappho's work, but it's not. It's an academic kind of literal translation. There were some poems that it's like, because Sappho, we really, we only have fragments. There's very few poems that are completely extant, if, if any. I'm sh Maybe there's one or two. I'm not an expert. But the woman who translated this book obviously is an expert. As an academic text, it's awesome. If you're at all interested in how translation works, like her footnotes, her footnotes were great. But in terms of like, I feel like this book was marketed incorrectly because I did not go into it like, I'm so excited for an academically good literal translation of Sappho's like complete work that we have extant. I was ready for poetry. So maybe it's unfair to include this on the list. Obviously for that, it's really good. It's really good as like a work of literal translation, helpful for academics, kind of like a like a research text or something to refer back to a reference text. Awesome. And if you're interested in the act of translation, very cool. As a book of poetry, not very good. The translations didn't, a lot of them didn't really grab me. It just seemed like the author was very afraid of taking any kind of liberty in order to get to the soul of the work rather than the literal words. So the translations didn't really grab me. And the biggest problem that I had is that like so many, you know, it's a lot of fragments. So it's like, what am I supposed to do with this poem that just says like tree, flower, cloth. <laughs> and it's like, you're so aware that that is not what Sappho wrote. Like this, it just needs different marketing. Like the back cover copy needs to be different. They just need to admit that this is a text, a reference text. If you are interested in what is actually extant and like a more literal translation of Sappho's work. But what am I supposed to do with tree cloth bird? Tree cloth flower, what am I supposed to do with that? So as a book of poetry, not very good. So like I said, pretty much all the books that I read this year were pretty good. Like these were the worst and like that all comes with some qualifications. Like I was really lucky and pretty much enjoyed everything I read this year. That has not always been the case. There are some books that have really pissed me off <laughs> and some that I do not, that I did not, I was not able to finish. So maybe I'll do a video about that at some point and tell you like, the worst books I've ever read, you know, according to my opinion. Honorable mention goes to actually a lot of editions of my books. <laughs> Might surprise you, but honorable, honorable mention for like angered me the most. A lot of my books, their first editions were published with an app, with an app, with an e-reader. You've probably heard me talk about it before. I guess I won't like say the name right now to put them on blast, but I've talked about them before. A lot of my books, yeah, they were originally published as eBooks uh, on this e-reader because they wanted original content. And the process was, I wrote the book. It went through two rounds of editing where an editor gave me suggestions and then I made the changes. And then it's supposed to be, okay, that's finalized, let's publish it. They had a third round, a secret little, little cheeky round where they brought in a fucking, someone who's obviously not good at proofreading because they put in errors. I don't know if they had a robot did it. It's if they had a robot did it. This is why editors are important folks because writers say shit like that in their first round. I don't know if they had a robot do it. That might explain it because sometimes Google, like Google's spell checker or whatever makes horrible choices sometimes. It can be very helpful, but it makes horrible choices sometimes. So you can't just like, I'll prove everything. For instance, when I submitted the final version of one of my books to be published after we went through the two rounds of editing, it mentioned the Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching being the essentially like the Taoist text. It's a religious text. It's a spiritual text. It's very pretentious of me to include it because I was writing like a cozy mystery. It, like the book itself is not pretentious. It's the foundation of a religion. That's not, <laughs> that's not pretentious. But me including it in the context that I included it, a little bit pretentious. When they published it, they published it, they flipped the A and the O and spelled it wrong. Someone went into my book 
and misspelled it on, like on purpose. I don't, I can, I can only assume not. I can only assume that someone wasn't trying to like sabotage me. That doesn't make any sense. But someone decided that they knew how to spell it better than the way it is spelled, I guess. And so when I like opened up my book, it said like Doa Deja and I'm like, Jesus Christ. And I had to like go back to the publisher and be like, you have to fix this copy. What the, mm. that was like the most egregious example. There was also the example of they published one of my books and somebody like added in a murder victim. <laughs> like in one of my cozy mysteries. So like, I actually don't recommend reading the first edition of any of my books. Read the version on Amazon. If you're at all interested, read the versions on Amazon because those are uh, most of them are the second edition and I edited them or I hired someone or even better, my partner edited them and he is a, he is very detail oriented, does a lot better of it and he's a hard ass about editing. He was mad when they corrected my other books to be incorrect. He was pissed because he edited a lot of them and then they went in and added incorrect stuff. I checked my original manuscript, they added mistakes. So honorable mention to my own books, which got published in their first edition with horrible typos and factual errors and just like egregious mistakes in them. And then I fixed them and then I fixed them. So if you get the Amazon versions, they should be all fixed. And if you find any mistakes, please tell me so I can cry about it and then correct it. But I think they're all good now. I feel like my grandmother would tell me if there were mistakes in the Amazon's version. So I'm pretty confident about it. But yeah, those are the worst books I read this year. Pretty good book year. I'm excited for what 2024 brings. I plan on focusing even more on reading stuff that's just fun for me. I actually like, I made my Goodreads goal to read like 56 books this year instead of 100. <laughs> so that I could read longer works and be a little more choosy and not feel like I have to rush through anything. But I really enjoyed reading 100 books. Um, if you are looking for some quick, fun reads, I have a bunch of them. I write cozy mysteries and romantic comedies. I also have a superhero sci-fi called Cardinal, which is my baby. That was my debut. The second in that series is gonna be coming out it's probably gonna be early next year, if I'm honest with myself. I'm hoping it'll be this year, that's the goal, but it'll probably be early next year. Check it out, you can browse my books in the description below. I promise I corrected the typos and then I spelled Dao De Jing correctly in this version. <laughs> Happy New Year! <laughs> I know it's like old to say that now. I hope you're having a wonderful 2024 so far and so excited to read more books and complain about them and hype up the good ones with y'all this year make sure you like and subscribe if you want to hear more complaints or positivity either or i do both of them i am versatile <laughs>